So how many people were with us last month in New Orleans? About half. Okay. So first handful of slides in this one are going to be a review, and then we're going to get into playing around with some life sim stuff. And so it's going to be interactive the whole time. If you know all the answers because you're in New Orleans for the first one, it's okay if you want to be a star student and yell them out. Okay, so use the results. We've talked a lot about this this week. I'm going to show you a few plots in the beginning, and it's just going to be, or, or graphics, and it's just going to be based on spending time in life in this week. Without running the model, what could you say about these situations with the information we're giving you? And like I said, for those of you that were with us last month, these first several slides are going to be review. The thing about these courses is, even though the other one's a prerequisite, it's not, we don't have the same class one-to-one, -one, so we try to make things different enough that they're relevant for this course while also not getting rid of stuff that might be relevant in both or would be valuable in both if you hadn't seen it from one, right? So appreciate you sticking with us. All right. Um, what do you see here? And anyone can answer even if you were there last month. Anything jump out at you? Anything look odd? This red line in the middle doesn't jump out to anybody? Yeah? Okay. So that's, if you can see it, that's no warning, no mobilization right here. Why do you think life loss takes a dive right at 6 a.m.? People are awake, easier to respond to warnings. Maybe this is a residential area and people are going to work, right? So far fewer people there when you're looking at that life loss distribution over the course of the day. All right. Life sim's got these really pretty scatter plots, right? So this is relative warning issuance. And if you saw something like this, you could say that life loss is clearly sensitive to the warning issuance parameter, that first public alert, right? So what, what might that tell you about your study area? Your consequences, your life loss consequences are really sensitive to warning. That's right. So probably in pre, our, our population center where our consequences are concentrated is in close proximity to our dam or levee. So immediately downstream in dam, closer to Levy's a little different, but closer to maybe the breach location or area of concern, the levy. Um, oops, excuse me. What are the possible reasons that life loss does this little blip up here? You think it would kind of level off once you get after breach. Basically, we're saying a lot of people, because we know that it's so sensitive in our population centers, almost immediately downstream, if people don't receive a warning until an hour after breach, they're probably exposed. So why would that change? You see that little uptick in life loss right here. Okay. Yep. What about people getting out on roads after the fact and putting themselves in a worse situation, right? Because you could vertically evacuate in a lot of structures and a structure is more stable than a vehicle. But if you got out on a road, you're much more likely to be caught evacuating, have your st stability criteria exceeded, right? All right. What time of day, based on this distribution of structures in your study area, what time of day do you think life loss would be highest? Nighttime, that's right. Residential structures primarily, right? So assume, all right, we've got... So order of magnitude more residential stu structures than the rest of our structures combined. Probably going to be at nighttime. All right. What would you expect, if your breach is right here, what would you expect life loss results to be sensitive to in this area right here? Morning time. Yes. Or imminent hazard identification, warning issuance delay, right? all those component parts on that warning and evacuation timeline that lead to when that warning's issued. Um, what else? 
How about the hydraulic conditions, right? Definitely be driving life loss. Would it be sent? We're not sampling uncertainty about it, right? But certainly life loss is impacted by the severity of the flood. All right. This is actually a, this is actually an appurtenant structure. This is a dike, the main dams over here for this particular example. This isn't backwater, so we're having spill releases. Sorry, we're having spill releases here along the main stem. This is the main dam, and then in this particular simulation, this breaches and comes down through and meets up here and adds. Pretty, it's it's a fairly large dike, so in this case, is almost full loss of the pool as well. So there's a lot of addition incremental flow. Good question. All right. What's driving life loss in these structures immediately downstream of the dam? You guys just had it on the last one. Warning time, right? What about much further down? What would you expect life loss to be driven by down here? Yeah. yeah, mobilization rate, right? And your hydraulic conditions, but flood conditions are components anyway. But yes, down in these pockets here and these pockets here where you have these Deeper flooding, life loss is high because flood characteristics are worse, but also people picking up from people who didn't take protective action to evacuate. Um, what might you do to help reduce some of this without making any structural changes to the dam? How might you reduce potential for life loss? We did that exercise this morning, right? I just had rafts, all sorts of cool ideas. What might you do here? Better warning messages, more direct information. Yeah, so to to get people to evacuate, right? Better messaging templates. Yep. Yep, making people aware. So building risk awareness, the dam, everything like that. Okay, that's a good one. What about putting a siren right up here for all these people so you could wake them up at night? It could be a good one too, right? All good, all good answers. All right, using LifeSim. A lot of cool things we can do, right? It's got these pretty animations. Get to see blue cars running all over the place. And let's hone in and say, all right, starting to look at our results. We run LifeSim, we look at our results, we're saying, all right, we're seeing a whole bunch of life loss right here. Why? Let's look at the animation. Okay, see all these cars stacking up. What happens? Oh, there's a bridge there. Did I? adjust the vertical offset in my road network to account for the bridge. Otherwise, it's just gonna read the terrain, right? Which is got the channel in it, hopefully. Um, so did I do that? And if I did, then what I can say is, okay, I've accounted for the vertical offset in my road network, so people should be able to go over the top of this and less water gets up over the road. So what we're saying here is all the water's, water's getting over the road here. We're going to lose this egress route. A community of, mm, I think there's 20, 20, 10 to 20,000 people in here, if I remember. <coughs> Excuse me. And two ways you can go. You can get up to reach an egress route up here, and then there's a highway to the south. So knowing you're going to lose that, that means all these people need to go to the south, right? And this might be an area where we want to warn earlier so that we can get people out on roads and out of there. Because you're flanked here by the river and then by this other reservoir. So using LifeSim for something like this is one way we can connect with emergency, the emergency management community, right? Those of you who work for AE firms and have more ability than we do at the core to reach out to emergency management community and offer stuff like this, which I think is a cool opportunity. All right, you can create cool plots like this where you can show how long before the flood wave arrives in different places. In this case, I'm showing the arrival time of two feet of depth, which 
we use as the non-evacuation depth by default in LifeSim that is an editable parameter, right? So this can be pretty powerful for emergency managers, saying all these people immediately downstream have less than four hours to evacuate if you get a warning to them when it happens. So anywhere between two and four hours. So you might want to consider warning for that particular community. You can do the same thing with roads when roads get overwashed. So you'll know when, obviously this plot looks very similar, but you have an understanding of when you're losing access to some egress routes that people might need and be closely correlated with the structures in the area, but still this can be really good information. You can look at evacuation outflows. Um, LifeSim doesn't preload roadways, right? But we want to make sure that in our LifeSim model, the way we're simulating traffic evacuation is reasonable. So let's look at this Woodall Rogers Freeway, get into the Department of Transportation uh, at the state level, get an average annual daily ta traffic count. LifeSim outflow is quite a bit, quite a bit lower than that. 200,000 and all right, how, how many people get on the road in life sim really quickly? Oops, about period of about five hours. We see that about 5,000 people get on the roads period of about five hours. Sorry, excuse me. That's two hours period of two hours, about 5,000 people got on the roads. So if I go here, I say, is it reasonable, given the average daily traffic count, that 5,000 cars can get on this road and evacuate? I think so. Peak outflow per hour was about um, 1,000, 2,000, like we just said. It's within the flow capacity of the road. So that's the type of check you can do in LifeSim to sanity check your evacuation, right? It's also really helpful with evacuation planning because you can look at the carrying capacity of roads and it'll help you with how you want to route people, right? If you're getting into a more compre comprehensive evacuation planning exercise. All right. So the heat maps already, you guys messed around with those. You don't have to heat map life loss. You could do expose par, whatever parameter you want. So those can be powerful. You can show where you're seeing concentrations of exposed population at risk. That helps tell the story. Also helps verify your life loss results, right? You know about these plots. Fox and Whisker, these are helpful. Um, if you want to verify life loss on roads, if you run LifeSim and life loss is, let's say it's 100, and life loss on roads is 80, if I saw that as a reviewer, I'd ask to see your model and I would get in there and, and really take a close look at it. Because I would, if life loss is unduly high or majority of your life loss comes from people getting out on roads <clears throat> could be something wonky going on with your road network but like with complexes right here and we've got this narrow inundation track but hydraulic conditions the flood severe floods fairly severe through here about 20 feet of water moving pretty quickly right so given that water arrives here pr fairly quickly people still trying to get out on roads have to go south to get to main egress routes thought it's this is this is reasonable we're not picking up the whole amount over here from this one location but this type of exercise is one that you'd go through because you really have to sanity check life loss on roads. It's important. Okay. Life's an example study. This is 
now we're getting into some stuff that's a little different. All right. So it's a flood hazard, dam breach. That boundary is the observed, is an observed flood extent or a modeled flood extent, excuse me. You can see how it meanders based on the topography, all those. What if this, I told you this was tailings rather than clean water? Does everyone know, who, does everyone know what tailings is? <clears throat> does anyone not know what tailings is? Yeah, tailings is basically a mining byproduct, right? So say you're mining iron ore. You need to extract that ore, and through that extraction process, you're pulling out the commodity that has some kind of value, right? And after it's extracted from that ore material, that remaining, what remains is, is called, referred to as tailings. And there are dams like, there are tailings dams all over the world at mines, right? Where they extract whatever it is they're mining, the iron ore, they're putting them in these tailings ponds, which are generally dammed, right? And then once they fill up, they move on to another one. And it's very concerning because tailings is like sludge. It's a, it's a thick, dense, could equate it to debris flow in some ways, at least in the density of the material and how destructive it is. Um, so what if I told you this was tailings? Would you make any changes to your life sim model if you knew it was tailings? You're not in your head. What would you do? Okay. Okay. So hold, hold on to that. Where would you expect life loss to be the highest after seeing the flood animation or the tailings an information? Do, do you even have enough information? Where would you expect to be highest? I'll show you that. I'll show you that animation again. Sorry? Where? Where do you think it's going to be highest? Right here? I would agree. With the information you have, I think that's perfectly reasonable. All right. You're right. Life loss heat map. You can see it's concentrated right here. All right. How would you review the flood characteristics at each structure. You did this in one of your workshops earlier this week. If you wanted information about depths and velocity at each structure, where would you go in Lifeson to get it? summary hydraulics and what it does is it extracts depth information about depths and velocities at the structure level that says 1500 depth times velocity so this is a non i can tell you this is a non-newtonian ras model so it's it's a little different than clean water trying to represent the tailings um it's in meters uh but you can, when you're generating summary hydraulics, you can use metric or U.S. feet, right? I use feet. You see these really high numbers. If I, never, if I never simulated a model, I would look at this and say, okay, we're going to exceed structure stability criteria at a lot of these structures, right? These values are extremely high. All right. Without more information, knowing that these results come from failure of a tailing stam, would you accept the results from LifeSim and use them as is? So, pretty symmetrically distributed, right? 
I said I ran LifeSim um, using all the parameters that we know were developed with clean water in mind. Would you take these numbers and move forward? It's no wrong answers, guys. I mean, there might be, but no one's going to give you a hard time about it. I'm saying if you hadn't made any changes, right? So you haven't made any changes as is, and you ran the model and you got these results, would you say, we're good, let's move on? No. Okay. Okay. I agree. Without running the model again, how might you account for tailings? Of the hazard? No. If I'd have made no other changes, I'd say, all right, we're, our, our median's here, but I'm going to say that at least we should be, if this was a fully quantitative risk assessment, I would say we at least need to select maybe the maximum because we know that life loss is probably going to be higher because of the tailings material. And we think that that changes the nature of how structures, vehicles, and people interact with the hazard such that maybe more structures topple, what have you. Um, or if people are exposed, their survivability is lower than it might be with clean water. So maybe you say, all right, I'm not going to run the model again. I'm just going to choose a, a higher number in my range of outcomes. It's possible. But I think you could do more. What changes could you make to your life's model to account for the impact of the tailings flow? Yeah. Okay. okay. So no way people would drive into it. Okay. Stability. What about scaling the stability, right? So if you know that you're dealing with material that's two to three times as dense as water and got some observed evidence about how destructive tailings can be. Maybe you could change your stability criteria, right? You can see over here, see the differences in these two plots? This is scaled by about half. This is our masonry stability criteria, but scaled by this by about half. And so we're increasing the likelihood in LifeSim that a structure topples being exposed to tailings. So that's one thing we can do in LifeSim, which gets at exactly what you were saying, Jim, about the tailings flow. But rather than trying to get the hazard to be different, we already got this non-calibrated, non-Newtonian RAS model. We're trying to get pretty close to representing the tailings. How can we, and how LifeSim reads that in, maybe think about this a little differently? And this is, this is an option. So when you think about, you know, some of you might be saying, how many tailings dams are in the U.S.? Um, Woody, we looked that up once. I can't remember. But it was an extremely low number. It was an extremely low number. These are generally um, not within the United States. But debris flow events happen in the United States, right? Montecito, January 2018, 23 people lost their lives from mudslide type of situation. So there are situations, right, where we're not dealing with clean water. And how can we account for those situations appropriately in life? This is what, I, this is what I'm trying to get you guys to think about here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Devin. I'm sorry? Willingness to enter a roadway. Yeah. So I think there's something to that. Like, you're definitely not likely to cross tailings. So you could, you could make a case. Um, for this particular situation, there's, there was so little time that vehicular evacuation wasn't really a thing. So, um, but absolutely, in a situation where you might have more time, changing that likelihood to enter a roadway to zero would make sense with tailings, right? Is that, um, there's one event where there was actually a truck that got sucked under the tailings and then kind of shot back up. So a person was submerged in tailings and somehow because of the density of the tailings, the truck ended up kind of tumbling and then resurfacing and that person lived. Um, highly unlikely, right? That is the some almost an extreme high hazard situation where 
life sim, we would say you lose your life more often than not. Survivability of a situation like that is quite low. Also, uh, and it's, I don't know how many times you close to work, but uh, trench and in areas essentially were kind of the four of them now shifting to treat them as family. Interesting. It's going to be a lot. Yeah, it is. I'd only heard rumblings of that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, rumblings is a funny word for that. <laughs> Uh, where would you go in life sim to find an estimate with uncertainty of the percent of your population at risk that mobilized? Anyone remember? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So change this little drop down down here from total mean life loss to percent mobilized population at risk. So this is super low. I, in most cases, when we do this, I would expect the inverse of this number. So it's 5%, I would expect it to be closer to 80, 90% generally. Um, unless it's a situation where it's rapid onset and people downstream have almost no time. So areas immediately downstream have almost no time, in which case you might see a pretty low mobilization rate. What else might you do to adjust life sim to account for tailings flow? Okay. Right. Okay. Increase the distributions. Okay. Also, your warning issues. I mean, a lot of the dams stuff we're talking about have that public interest, that public uh, emergency action plan. Mm -hmm. and some of the mining companies may not. So that's the big research. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to dance around it. This is a project that we're working on right now. Um, it's a validation study for the Brumadinho dam failure in Brazil. And Bale, the mining company, actually did have a detailed emergency action plan. They trained everyone downstream on it, but they knew that the entire mining admin area would be overrun by tailings in a minute. That was what they predicted with their modeling. And they said more than 200 people would die. And they trained everyone on their warning plan, like where to evacuate in different points in the mine, things like that. But ultimately, it said there's no time at all, so people need to self-rescue is the idea, which is basically a, a diplomatic way of saying, good luck, you're on your own. So they knew this was going to happen. They said, if this dam breaches, it's going to get to these places where all these people, where everyone is on the mine when, during the day, when the mine, you know, when people are on the mine working, more than 200 people will die. They knew this was possible. I think they recognized that they might need to take action or were trying that they were at that time when the dam failed, they were people um, on the dam putting new instrumentation in. So there's things that they were doing that made you think that they might have some concern about this particular structure. But 270 people died from that particular event. So they, they predicted effectively exactly what would happen. And it did get into that admin area in a matter of minutes. Um, I think that's what the mine should have done is relocate the admin area when they realized that once that tailings pond became full and they had some concerns, it, it, it obviously would have been really beneficial if that admin area was somewhere else. Whether or not they were working towards that, I don't know. Um, but they, their understanding of what, what they believe the the outcome would be, or their understanding of what could go wrong, you know, their dam breach analysis that they paid someone to put together came up with something that effectively was effectively represented by the observed case. Okay, what about adjusting the fatality rates? Would you feel comfortable doing that? Yes. So, 
Right. If you had good information about fatalities from tailings flow and you could get that in here, sure. But in the absence of that good information, how, how might you change this? Um, and I'm not sure that you, I'm not sure that you could, right? Or that you would. The, the average fatality rate on our high hazard curve, depending on whether you use cumulative average or weighted average, is about 70%. So over a thousand iterations, if you're placed in high hazard, about 70% of the time, we're going to sample someone losing their life, right? Tailings flow is survivability is lower than water. How much lower? I don't think we have enough information to say. But survivability of Brumadinho was quite a bit lower. The percent of par exposed that Paris is more like 80-ish percent, so 80 to 90 maybe. Um, I could go, I could just go in here and punch 80% in and then get the, you know, maybe get whatever answer we want, but you know, maybe that's not reasonable. More, are we, are we capturing the observed result? And if not, is it, is it reasonable? And knowing that it's tailings, might we just select something higher? So these are all things we're thinking through right now. What about changing the likelihood? Well, this is getting into the alternatives editor, right? So you, you set up in the workshop, you put, or you put in hazard ID, hazard communication delay, everything like that. You can go over to evacuation parameters and change a whole bunch of other stuff. Change the non-evacuation depth, evacuation time step, live traffic updates, fraction of limited mobility under 65, limited mobility over 65. A lot of different parameters. Is it reasonable to think that you could swim in tailings? So how LifeSim uses fraction that can swim is if you're exposed out in the open and you're placed in high hazard from your know, submergence is exceeded, not stability, because stability we're saying you'd be washed away. It doesn't matter if you can swim or not. But if it's depth, we're saying if you can swim, you could swim to safety. So I think for tailings, I would knock that down to zero. Can't swim through mining sludge. Not really. Um, Increasing limited mobility. If it's like tailing. But I guess that is the first violation for people. That's too soon. Yeah, limited mobility would, would basically say that. So people aren't really going to horizontally evacuate in a situation where there's no warning and, and the arrival time is really quick. So that, that's effectively accounted for in the timing component and the, the nature of the hazard. Limited mobility would decrease people's ability to move vertically. But if we don't have evidence that people had limited mobility, and would we change that, right? Um, I could change it, you know. And this is, with these validation studies, these are the things we think about, right? Is, is it reasonable to change this particular parameter to get closer to the right answer? In that case, if I, we're, we're talking about people who work on a mine, they're on their feet a lot, moving around, some of them operate big equipment, things like that. Generally, people working age, so under 65, and most of them probably aren't limited mobility. And limited mobility or not, for this, in, in a really catastrophic case like this, it doesn't matter, but you're absolutely right. It would affect the vertical evacuation component. Yeah. Let's see about something related to that. It's like we're looking at probability of like survival in a structure. Like if you have a foot of space between you and the ceiling, that you're likely to survive and it's going to be hit on that. Because they can pretty much anything overhead high is really good to count on being able to you know, move effectively and possibly being Get your body out, out of that sludge onto something higher than that. So that ceiling of where you can survive, it would make sense to lower it. Okay. Yeah. Forty-five percent ability to swim is for when a lot of these deaths have died, maybe less than next side of you. 
what, what's the for, for the fraction that can swim what's the velocity component because that's only read in when it's submergence criteria getting exceeded so is there a velocity threshold for fraction that can swim no. Uh, anytime the stability threshold is exceeded due to velocity or depth times velocity. Right. That that's not a component of the calculation. It's right. assumed that they're in the high hazard situation. Right. Yeah. So it's it's only when it's submergence. Good question though. All right. Yeah. So yeah. There was there was some talk about that. I think Devin, you were talking about that. Uh, oh, no, not changing the non-evacuation depth. You were talking about likelihood to enter a road. So changing the non-evacuation depth and knocking it down to zero. So basically not allowing anyone to move. Yep. Maybe you have a compelling reason to do that. Um, situations where we do that, generally, if we're seeing a whole bunch of people drive out onto a road when water is fairly shallow and life risk is really driven by people being on overwashed roads, so maybe there's a foot, two feet of water, low flow condition, but where people are still evacuating because of the decision to enter a roadway. In situations like that, we might lower the non-evacuation depth because it makes a lot more sense to just stay in your structure that's maybe get, you know, water might not even make it above the foundation, right? So that's generally when we mess around with that parameter, but it could be worth thinking about here, right? There's a lot of stuff you can dig into in life sim and start going through. You can get down into the weeds pretty quick. And if you turned into a nerd about this stuff like you have. It's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a ton of data for Brumadinho. It's mostly... Be yeah, there's been a couple in Brazil over the last... Yeah, in the last decade, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, the amount of, so there were some changes for the mining industry in Brazil after that one, but Brazilian Senate ordered really detailed investigation post Brumadinho. There's a lot of really, really good data. There's some books that have been read, uh, written, um, and read about the Brumadinho event. Some of them are are pretty um, pr provocative, but very much accusing Valley of negligence. Um, but there's a lot of really good information on this particular one. We didn't know that there was a lot of really good information, but we got into it. We just kept pulling on the string, and we found loads of data, including a dissertation of um, how they identified bodies, which is a little a little gruesome. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really good information from this, and it definitely has, in fact. Yeah. Right. This is iron ore, and so there was so much ore, because the extraction method wasn't terribly good there's still a fair amount of ore that made its way into the tailings and over time that got into the embankment and you think of embankment failure acting a certain way but because all the iron ore that got into the embankment this was almost more of a brittle failure like you would have like a concrete monolith or something like that it just went immediately um we were probably two, three months away from wrapping all this up and having papers and stuff like that. So for those of you that go to conferences and things, um, the Life Loss Workshop in Knoxville in October, you guys will be at TVA. We'll, uh, Bill John, Johnstone's the person I'm working with on this and we'll have presen the presentation on this, but we'll have papers and conference stuff. I think this is a pretty interesting one. All right, real quickly, Woody, how am I doing on time? And I go till. Okay, I'm going to try to get done quickly. Very quickly, I'm going to talk about risk computation. And the reason is because we've been talking about LifeSim all week. LifeSim's a really cool tool for estimating consequences. But you've heard us talk about risk all week too, right? And consequences only make up one 
half of the risk equation. So what do we do with those life sim results, right? We've got to link them up to our understanding of the likelihood of the hazard. And when we're talking about dam and levee safety, the likelihood of poor performance for that flood defense structure. All familiar with this? Risk is a function of hazard performance and consequences. So likelihood of loading, likelihood of poor performance, and then multiply those by life loss. That gives you your expected annual life loss estimate, like expected value, right? What do we use? We get a whole bunch of numbers, can put them in tables like this, bring them into tools like um, Damray, mass, you know, big Excel models, or got this new tool called RMC Total Risk that's in beta right now. And you can bring in your hazard, right? Your frequency curve. Go through the event tree component to, of, for different failure modes to come up with system response. So when this is loaded, how is it going to respond? Core uses an event tree approach. There's other ways that you can get system response into total risk. And then it links up to LifeSim. You can tabularly put in a table like I just showed you on the last slide, so you could hand jam it in there. Or you can link it to your LifeSim model, which is pretty cool. And it'll bring in all of those numbers. It's even cooler is that when you link it to LifeSim, you can fit a distribution to your results, right? So you've got a total risk is automatically going to fit a distribution. In this case, it fit truncated normal. I think it looks fairly normally distributed. Um, so I might select normal distribution from the dropdown and total risk is going to sample uncertainty about those consequence estimates. It's a powerful risk analysis tool. It's going to be released sometime this summer. Um, that'll be available to the public as well. Go ahead. Michaela would be a good one to talk about where you're picking up the reservoir frequency stuff from. For, for dams, a lot of times we'd be using RFA, but um, what is it? What's ERL? Yeah, what is it? Expected record length or something? What is it? So equivalent record length, you can use ERL as well. You can, um, can pull in stuff from RMC best fit. So this works really nicely with the RMC's suite of software tools, um, but you could use output from, uh, you know, really any statistical package in theory. What, what, that's what makes total risk really nice is it it's integrated with the other tools in the RMC software suite, but you're not beholden to those tools. You can still use total risk and all of its computational capability with other stuff. So if you had something, say, from, I don't know, HEC SSP from 10 years ago when you wanted to, you know, five years ago, and you wanted to use it rather than going through and migrating stuff over to, like, RMC Best Fit or something, you absolutely could use that information in Total Risk. Good question. Anybody else? Thank you guys for being so engaged.